All right, so we are going to get ready to read chapters 12 and 13 today of Blood on the River. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody who can't make it today. Aaron's asleep. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we left off in chapter 11. Oh, the, the big question for you guys was, um, what is a weapon that is more powerful than a sword? What were some of your answers to this? Raise your hand. Don't shout it out. I'm kind of interested to see what you guys all picked. And then we'll go from there. The question, again, you had to use your read strategy on this question like you've been doing. And you guys have been doing really well with that. Um, it says, what is a weapon that is more powerful than a sword? Kaden, what do you think? A bow. Okay. Um, and did you use evidence to kind of back up why you believe that was more powerful? Okay. All right. More powerful than you have. I have not. I will do that tomorrow. Uh, Chloe, a gun. You say a gun is more powerful? A musket? Okay. What do you think, Sophia? A bow and arrow. We poison the arrow. And you know, these, um, these um, gentlemen are dumb enough to cut through a tree and get poisoned. It's true, too. <laughs> so they can easily just step on an all right, chapter 12, Wingapo, hello, literally my beloved friend, Poka Tower means fire, Atonse arrows, Netopu friends, Maripo enemies, and Werewants chief, literally he is wealthy. These are Algonquin English words compiled by John Smith, William Strachey, and Thomas Harriet. So that, we're on page 89, yes. Um. The next morning, not to, um, yeah, but these sound like names of wine. Oh, well, could be, I guess. The next morning, Captain Smith does not bring me a musket. He brings me a book. It is well worn and the stitching is coming loose. I sound out the letters of two of the words on the cover. Thomas Harriet. Thomas Harriet lived in the Roanoke colony, Captain Smith explains. He learned much of the Algonquin language, wrote it down, brought his papers back to England, and they were published in this book. I want you to learn these words. They will be better protection than any weapon. I open the book. The pages hold two columns. On the left are words I understand. Man, houses, shoes, axe, sea turtle. On the right are strange words I've never seen before. Nemero, yehawkons, moccasins, tomahawk. Terrapin. Farther down the page is a word with no English translation next to it. I sound it out. Raccoon, I say. What does that mean? It's an animal we don't have in England, he says. You'll see one soon enough, especially if you're out at night. It's a bit like a small badger with black circles around its eyes. Raccoon, I say again, trying to imagine such an animal. I find numbers one, two, three is translated nikat. Ning Nus. This language will be your protection outside the fort and within it as well, he says. I know he means that this will make me valuable as a translator to the gentleman who might have little use for me otherwise. I'm disappointed that I won't be learning to use a musket, but the new words roll off my tongue and make me feel as if there's power in them. And so every day we drill, just like the young Powhatan boys who don't get their breakfast until they have shot their targets. I do not get my breakfast until I have done a bit of sword fighting and learned at least two new words in Algonquin. In June, Captain Smith's name is finally cleared and he is sworn in on the council. Maybe it is because he has been too busy lately to insult the gentleman every single day or because Reverend Hunt has interceded for him yet again. Or simply because the council members see that they need his good sense and important skills. At, le at last, Captain Smith has been given the position that the Virginia Company assigned to him. On June 22nd, Captain Newport and the rest of the Mariners set sail for England. 
They carry loads of clapboards and sassafras root and barrels of shining ro shiny rocks that we hope contain gold. They sail away in the Susan Constant and the Godspeed and leave this discovery and the shallop for us to use for travel here in Virginia. Captain Newport also takes all of the food stores except 14 weeks worth of wheat and barley for the 100 or so of us colonists. He says he will return with fresh stores by October. It begins a few days after Captain Newport leaves. First one man, then another, then five more, then a dozen, all growing, groaning and feverish with swollen faces and bloody diarrhea. Never had I heard such sounds of misery, the moaning and the whimpering, the begging to be released from their bodies. And then they began to be released, sometimes one, sometimes two or three, turning up stiff and cold in the morning feel dizzy and I'm nauseated and I'm still able to stand and so I help to drag the bodies outside the fort and dig graves. Soon there are so many sick that there is no one with strength to tend the gardens, no one with strength to hunt or fish. We are left with a cup of barley and a cup of wheat for each man per day and this is filled with wriggly mealworms. I help cook the grains in the big pot over our communal cook fire and I watch as the mealworms float to the top. As we grow hungrier, more and more men become ill. Those who still have the energy to argue have theories about what is causing the sickness. It's a curse. Savages have cursed us, one man says. No, you're wrong. It's the filthy river water, says another. It's salty at high tide and slimy at low tide, and that's all we've got to drink. You're both wrong. It's starvation, pure and simple, comes another explanation. There's more worms than grain in our meal. No, 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 it's the wet and chill that's killing us. The rain comes right into my tent and I sleep shivering every night. Sleep? Who gets to sleep? I'm on watch every third night. A man can't stay healthy when he gets no rest. You're all wrong, said another. It's Ratsbane. There's a Spanish spy among us and he's poisoning us all. I know arsenic poisoning when I see it. But soon, even those who think they have an explanation are too sick for discussions. Captain Smith falls ill then Captain Gosnold and Master Percy, and then Richard too, and Reverend Hunt. What about what we Some days I cannot stand. I lie in my bed groaning from the pain in my belly. Whether it's from hunger, poison, or sickness, all I know is that I'm miserable. On the days when I can move, I bring food and water to Captain Smith, Reverend Hunt, and Richard. They are all sicker than I. Richard just looks at me when I bring him the salty water and wormy grain. I wonder if he thinks I'm bringing him such bad fare out of spite and not because it's all we have. His eyes are glassy with a faraway look. I think he will likely die even between, even before the two of us have had a chance to put the past behind us and become friends. Henry is still up and around doing his chores for President Wingfield, but Abram is ill. President Wingfield himself is the finest of help. I hear Henry and Abram whispering one night when they think I'm asleep. Stolen Edward. Cracked me and raw, said Henry. I hear the cracking of eggshells and loud slurping. I'll get you some wine tomorrow. Me too. I told him if he doesn't share the stores with you and me, he'll be doing his own laundry and mending soon. I sucked in my breath. They've got eggs. We ate all of our chickens weeks ago and shared the last eggs all around. At least we thought those were the last eggs. What's that? Henry's voice startled me. You're awake then, you scum. Suddenly his thick hand is at my throat and his dark form looms over me. You heard nothing. Do you understand me? He hisses. We are very close to the other tent, so he speaks softly but with cold meanness. Nothing. I try to nod with his hand clamps harder on my throat and I can't breathe. Swear it, he demands. Swear it in God's name. You will tell no one what you heard. I swear it, I croaked. He gives my throat one last shake and then releases me. Speak of it and you will die, he says. I have no doubt he means it. He is protecting his master. Without his master, Henry may be of no use to anyone. He might not even be worth his share of the dwindling food rations. He is protecting himself. I lie in the dark listening to Richard's ragged breathing. 
Will he die with his last memory of me being of something mean I said or did to him? And what of Captain Smith and Reverend Hunt? Will they die and leave me with no one to be my ally against the anger and whims of the gentleman or Henry? The next morning, two more corpses are dragged out of the tent. I'm barely able to stand, but I will help to dig the graves. In my head, I count up how many of us there are left and realize we have buried half of our men. The savages might as well come finish us off now, I hear a man say, and we'll disappear just like the Roanoke colony did. And all the while, Master Wingfield eats his meat and drinks his wine. So real quick, what did Sam overhear with Henry talking that night? What's he, what's he overhear, Ethan? I am barely able to stand, but I will help to dig the graves. And in my head, I count up how many of us are left and realize we have buried half our men. The savages might as well just finish us off now, I hear a man say, and we'll disappear just like the Roanoke colony did. But all the while, Master Wingfield eats his meat and drinks his wine. John Layden brings two shovels. Yes. I know. But now we haven't. It's okay. I backed up just a little bit. John Layden brings two shovels, one for me and one for him. We don't go far from the fort to dig the graves, and two soldiers come with us as guards. And as we dig, we look warily around, hoping there are no Indians to shoot at us today. If we had more strength and more courage, we could go into the forest to hunt and bring back fresh meat. But too many men have gone to hunt and have staggered back into the fort with arrows in their bellies, only to die in agony a few days later. And now I know there is meat and eggs within the walls of our fort. Captain Smith is looking a little better today. He is up on his own and so I will not need to bring him breakfast. I bring a bowl of wormy grains to Reverend Hunt in his tent. He is pale and lean, his cheeks sunken in. When I hand him the bowl, he fumbles with it and nearly drops it. Can he live much longer on this foul food and salty water? Reverend Hunt, I said, I have a question. He nods, he is ready to listen. If I have sworn not to do something, sworn in God's name, must I keep my word? He frowns. Who has made you swear something in God's name? He demands. I hang my head. I cannot tell this or Henry will clamp his hands around my throat until there's no breath left in me. Reverend Hunt's hands shake as he lifts a spoonful of gruel to his mouth and he chews, thinking, and then speaks. If you will not tell me all about it, I cannot give you an answer. But you are capable of finding the answer on your own. Your heart will know better than your head. Choose the path of love and not of fear. The choice you make out of love will always be the right one. I leave him and go to chop wood for the cook fire. With the last of my strength, I slam my frustrations into the wood with my ax. I hate Henry. I hate being afraid of him. If I keep my sworn oath to him, is that a choice made out of love? No, it's a choice made out of fear. I have grown to love Reverend Hunt with his patience and wisdom and his love for me. Yes, I throw down the ax. I have made my decision. I will tell what I have sworn not to tell. I go to find Captain Smith where he is helping John Layden to split clapboard. They're both weak and the work is going slow. Captain Smith, I say, I would like to speak to you in private. Oh no. Do you think he made the right choice? Yep. I'm scared. All right, chapter 13. As I understand by report, I am much charged with starving the colony. I did always give every man his allowance faithfully, both of corn, oil, aqua vitae, as was by the council proportion. That was um, a quote from the journal of Edward Wingfield. And I say baloney. It says, I am charged with starving the colony, but I always gave every man his allowance faithfully. No, that's baloney. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 yeah, baloney. that's baloney. Master Wingfield is no longer our president. He is under arrest, locked up on the discovery, and his private store of wine, dried beef, eggs, oatmeal, and other good food has been shared equally among all of us. He says he was keeping it to dole out to us if we ran out of provisions, but that didn't keep the council from voting him down. Now we have Captain Ratcliffe 
as our president. Captain Smith says we've gone from the frying pan into the fire. What's that mean? Um, well, I think that means that they've gone from worse to better. No, no, I think it's they think that Captain Smith thinks that they've gone from worse to more worse. <laughs> All right, so maybe they're not in the best position yet. Reverend Hunt is looking much better. Many of us gave him some of our share of eggs and meat, and so he has been eating well for days. We have had rain, too, great drenching storms of it. We have caught it in buckets and barrels to drink, and the river is no longer so salty. The rainwater tastes so sweet. I would think it had honey in it. Reverend Hunt has color in his cheeks again, and he is able to lead Sunday services for the first time in many weeks. Captain Smith has taken all of the credit for discovering Master Wingfield's stash, and for that, I am grateful. Henry has no idea it was I who told, and so he has had no compulsion to kill me. Richard is much better now, too. I am relieved. I decide to take the first step towards becoming his friend. Richard, do you want to see my sword? I ask one day when he is up and looking stronger. I could show you some of what Captain Smith is teaching me. Richard looks at me warily as if he thinks this could be a trick. I just thought you might be interested, I said quietly. I look down, avoiding his eyes. There is silence between us, and then Richard says, Are you ready to fight a duel yet? I cringe. Is he challenging me to a duel? But when I look up, he's grinning. Not yet, I tell him. But Captain Smith says I'm learning well. Come on, I'll show you a few things. I let Richard try on my armor and have him fasten the belt around his waist so he can feel the weight of the sword, too. He pulls the sword out of its sheath and holds it in both hands. I tell him about what Captain Smith is teaching me, the footwork and the sword work. Suddenly, Richard's eyes close, and a look of pure sadness comes across his face. Richard, what is it? Are you going to faint? I never should have had him try on heavy armor when he's barely well. He shakes his head. James, he says. If he stops himself to keep from crying, I know, I say. I've thought about it a hundred times. If only James had had armor, he might still be alive. Richard nods gratefully, that, grateful that I have said what he was thinking. Then a thought strikes me. Richard, you need armor. So many have died. There must be extra. Let's go talk to Captain Smith. Together we go to Captain Smith to ask, and he takes a good look at Richard. He's a couple inches shorter than I am and somewhat wider. Captain Smith scratches his beard thinking, no one as slight as Master Clovel has died, but we will cut some armor down to fit you. The blacksmith is put to work to remake a chest plate. The first time Richard stands wearing his armor, he grins at me. I know I'm on my way to making a friend. Captain Smith decides that now that some of us are well, every able-bodied man must be skilled at using a musket. He gathers the men who are new to weapons, the commoners and servants, to begin training. He shows us how to keep the slow match burning by blowing the ash off of it every few minutes and how to use it to ignite the gunpowder. We learn each step, prime the pan, charge the piece with powder, put in the musket ball, ram down the charge, cock the match. We use a big tree with a mark on it as a target. The first time I fire my musket, the kick nearly throws me out onto the ground. I miss the tree completely, but so do most of the others. By the end of our training session, my ears are ringing, my arms are sore, and I smell like gunpowder. But I have hit the mark three times. Captain Smith says, we will continue to train each week until the tree is full of musket shot. The extra rations for Master Wingfield do not last long. And soon we're back to the wormy grains. I wonder why the natives do not mount another raid if they really want us gone. There are hardly 50 of us left, and those that are left are half starved and weak. Maybe they're just letting starvation finish us off, I think. Outside the fort is plenty of food, fish, oysters, rabbits, berries. But there are Indians hiding behind the trees. No one has the courage to venture out any farther than is necessary to dig graves for our dead. Then one day, I hear the words I'd been dreading. Savages, arm yourselves. We're under attack. I hear the scraping of metal as the guards load the cannons. This is it, I think. They've been watching, waiting, maybe even counting our burials. They know we have only a few men left. They've come to wipe out our colony. Richard and I hurry to put on our armor and ready our muskets. 
and soon we hear shots from outside the fort. But these are not the shrill battle cries. Shouts, I'm sorry, shouts, not shots. Um, shrill battle cries, I've expected any moment. They are calls of Wengapo. Richard and I run to the front gates of the fort. The gate has been thrown wide open and natives, men, women, and children are walking in. They look around curiously at our rotting tents and the big iron pot hanging over the cook fire. They all carry baskets. When I see what's in the baskets, I gasp. They're filled with bread and corn, fish, meat, squash, and berries. The smell of the fresh bread makes me nearly faint with hunger. One of our soldiers tries to grab a chunk of meat right out of a basket, but the Indian man holding it puts up his hands abruptly to stop him. Captain Smith comes forward. He speaks in Algonquin with our visitors, and I listen closely, trying to understand what they're saying. They're here to trade. They will give us food from their recent harvest in exchange for our copper, hatchets, swords, and muskets. No. Captain Smith nods agreeably. I wonder if he will actually give them swords and muskets? The Virginia Company has given us strict orders never to let the Indians get their hands on our weapons. Captain Smith translates for our leaders. Our visitors say that within the Powhatan Empire, there are tribes who are our friends and some who are our enemies. I think we talked about that. One, our enemies are the tribes closest to us because they feel we are encroaching on their land. They are the Paspege, whose land we are on, and also the Weenock, the Apopomatuck, the Kisiak, and the, yeah, right, Kuyo, whatever. Our friends are the Arahatic and the Pamumki and the Mataponi and the Yukonan. Your guess is as good as mine. Those who are our friends will intercede for us with our enemies. They will try to convince them that we pose no threat, that we're only using a small piece of land, and we're not making war with them. They also tell us we should cut down the tall grass near our fort because that is where our enemies are hiding when they shoot at us. Captain Smith tells them we are thankful for their message and for their peacekeeping efforts. Then he invites them to come sit in our common eating area around our fire pit. We all watch hungrily as they negotiate the trading. Captain Smith drives a hard bargain. He will not give away a single bead cheaply. By the time the Indians leave, all the baskets of food have become ours. They, they leave with some colorful glass beads, mirrors, bells, needles, pins, several pieces of copper, and three hatchets. Captain Smith does not trade away a single sword or musket. Why is there a sprinkle in my book? So what's really interesting about this, and I'll keep this video going for just a minute while we talk about it. Um, what information do the natives share with the colonists when they come to the fort in peace? First of all, remember, they just got attacked. They've been getting attacked by Native Americans. And now all of a sudden we have a Native American group that's coming to the fort and they're peaceful because what do they say? They what do they say at the door? That kind of clues you in that they're peaceful. Wingapo. That's a friendly greeting. So it means hello, friend. So what information did the natives give them? What information did the natives that currently came in and wanted to trade give them about what's going on in that area that they have settled? What do they what do they say? They said to cut down like cut the tall grass because that's where their enemies are hiding. They gave them some key key clues or key ideas on how to escape some of the Indian attacks. Well, who's attacking them? This Native American group is coming in. They're not attacking them. So who exactly is attacking them? The um the, the, the people that weren't there on the the tribes that are closest to them because they feel like the settlers have basically come over and taken their land, which they did. Um, but the, the tribes that are further away, including the ones that they just were introduced to, they are peaceful. They are their friends. They are friends to the settlers. And so these peaceful tribes are going to try and intercede. Basically, they're going to try and, 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 and be the the barrier between unhappy natives, settlers. Then you've got 
the friendly natives that are going to try and be the communication barrier. They're going to try and help bring the peace a little bit and make it a little bit more bearable. So they have found out that they do have some allies in this situation. Not all the natives are bad. Well, Not all that. the natives are unfriendly. You, really you have to remember that because it's going to play a part in this story. Okay. Um, what I want you to do. Oh, and they wanted to trade. They wanted to trade because the natives want those weapons. But yeah. John Smith was smart enough not to give them those I mean, weapons. He gave them three he gave them hatchets, which that's not necessarily terrible because they yes, probably have. Like well, they have hatchets on their own. So, I mean, they have hatchets to cut wood and timber and things like that to make I mean, canoes. So, right. So, hatchets aren't necessarily a terrible thing. It's, it's the muskets and the cannons and the swords if they give those to the natives then that's just going to be more ammunition to attack they could have despised the muskets. so right but Ca captain smith did not give any of those so what you're going to do today is chapter 12 and 13 